For the rest of us, would you turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 9, verses 19 through 29. I want you to think about what we just sang. Ephesians 3, Paul's praying a prayer over the church. And his prayer includes this, that, Lord, would you help your people to have the power to understand how wide and long and high is this love, this beyond understanding, this mercy, this grace. As we continue to dig in Romans chapter 9, we're going to look at this yet again. And I invite you just to join with me as we pray before we move into God's word together. Let's pray. Father, thank you again, as we've expressed in song, we're in awe of your incredible love. There's nothing we've said or done or can ever do that would deserve that which you've done for us. You became poor so that we could become rich. And it's all about your mercy, your love, your grace, your kindness. Father, would you take this word as it's found in Romans 9, and would you help us to once again um, embrace all of what you show yourself to be, your goodness, your mercy, your kindness, your patience. Lord, help us to see it all, how it fits together, and may our hearts just well up in worship and celebration because of who you are and what you've done. Help us now, we ask by your spirit in Christ's name. Amen. Checked in with a couple of people this morning and uh, something about Montana Fair. You guys know something about that? I, I know that's been a bit of a popular spot for some people to be at least this last week. It's been running pretty hard, roaring even. Um, rides, food trucks, 4-H competitions, evening entertainment, so on and so on. Um, I'll just, uh, you know, be upfront and honest, transparent. So I was a part of that too. And a couple other folks maybe from our church family because there's something called the Art Barn. And at the Art Barn, we get to exhibit certain pictures. And it's something that we do sometimes as uh, photographers and those kinds of things. So we're getting a new photography club started, um, Montana Nature Photography. And uh, we're, we're working this new club. And so some of us decide, let's go to the Art Barn at the fair on Tuesday, and let's just look at all the pictures as a club. And let's uh, see those pictures and check out what we see and, and just kind of in, enjoy them. And at the same time, learn something from them because we can help each other. And so our express purpose was to go as club. And for those of us that put things in the fair, um, that we would look at those pictures and then offer some constructive criticism, right? Some things that help you grow as a photographer and uh, you may see it differently than the other person and how do you put that all together? So uh, we proceeded to go ahead and to do that and we're looking in to see, you know, how did those pictures go? Were there, you know, there's a blue ribbon, that's first prize, uh, red ribbon is second prize, white ribbon's third, and a, a golden colored one is an honorable mention. So there's four types of ribbons that are awarded to pictures. So it's kind of a fun exercise to do, and we got together, made that happen on Tuesday, and uh, we're going through all of those kinds of things, and um, I learned a lot from my friends that are so much better photographers than I am, and so I'm listening and learning and asking questions, and it's kind of going back and forth. Jerry and I were talking about this earlier today, and I learned the value, Jerry, of black frames and the white matting, and you were talking about some of that, but um, sometimes though, we're looking at the pictures, and we're saying, okay. Does this make sense? I mean, look at this picture, and now look at the one that they gave the ribbons to. And why did that one get a ribbon when this one got nothing? It just didn't make sense at times, right? So let me, let me just show you a little bit here. I mean, sometimes we're just scratching our heads about decisions and stuff like that, right? So let me show me. It, it doesn't even do it justice on this big screen, but it's a great picture. I know the photographer, and someone looked at that. Wow, that looks like a painting. And it kind of does, right? It's really well done. It just was there amongst many others, and it didn't receive a ribbon of any kind. It's a great picture, right? Um, there's this one. Um, I'll own that one. Okay, that was one of mine. <laughs> but um, I liked it a lot, but I was listening to the photographers. They're telling me things that can improve the picture. Great, awesome. Um, for whatever reason, the judges looked at that and thought, oh, that's okay, but really nothing. Um, one of many. Fair enough. Okay. Here's what we were learning, though. 
if you're not the judge, you can't change their mind, right? It's not open for debate. You don't know what they saw. You don't know what they were looking at or what caught their eye. Uh, You don't know how much they maybe understood what went behind certain pictures and all that took place with that. And I can tell you from experience that you don't want me to be the judge of pictures that have portraits of people because I do wildlife and landscapes. I don't do people shots a whole lot. I'm not really good at it. And I certainly don't know the things of these people that do that professionally are amazing with it. You wouldn't want me to be the judge of that. But what we were learning was this thing of, it's not a good idea to second guess the judge, right? Because you don't, and more than that, you can't change their mind. You're not gonna change anything. You can groan about it, whine about it, but it doesn't change anything, right? Um, It was a good exercise at that point to say, you know, we just need to learn how to be okay with whatever the judge decides at that point. And it's okay, because they've been given that authority. And they're the judge for that competition, and they make their decision, and that's just kind of how that plays out. That's always a great reminder for all of us, right? Not in charge. That person is. Get to yield to that. And can we learn some things through it? As we come to Romans chapter 9, God's focusing in chapter 9, 10, 11 on the relationship between God and his people Israel and the non-Jewish people of the world called Gentiles in the Bible and just how the mercy and grace of God gets poured out. And Paul spends three chapters on this because it's such an incredibly important topic in the church. And the reason is for the church in Rome, it's made up of two large groups of people uh, forming the church. You have those that are Jewish in background, that have come to faith in Christ, and then you have the non-Jewish people in background, and, and mixed with all of that may be slaves and free people and men and women and so forth, and this is the church in Rome. But they're, they're wrestling through how to get along, how to engage together when you've got cultures that don't fit together, that clash, that are at odds with each other. How do you become one? How do you become a family? All those kinds of things. Paul is delving into this even as he's talking about the sovereignty of God and and the fact that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's established his covenant promises, and he's called out his people from the nations, Israel, and he's working through Israel, and blessing will come to the nations through Israel. Messiah comes through Israel. Paul lays all those things out. And then he's wrestling with this question along with the church family. Why is it that so few Jewish people receive and accept Jesus as Messiah? Why is it that there are so few Jewish people in the church when there are so many non-Jewish people that, that hear the good news of Christ and respond in faith and there are so many non-Jewish people in the church but so few Jewish people in the church? It was true then and it's true today. We've talked about that a little bit, haven't we, with the statistic in Israel right now is less than 1% of all Jewish people in Israel know Jesus as Messiah. And that's true globally, not just in Israel. So Paul is processing, working that through for the church and and helping the church wrestle through that. And you remember with me back in Romans 9, 1 through 5, Paul just agonizes. He says, "My, my heart is just filled with agony for my people because they're so close and yet they're so far. I mean, they, theirs is the adoption of sons, theirs is the covenant, theirs is the law, theirs is the glory, the temple worship, all these things that they've been given. And, and, and the patriarchs and, and Messiah's line runs through Abraham and his family and yet so close and yet so far. So many not yet part of the church. As Paul moves on in chapter 9 and verse 6 and following, the argument then was being raised that, well, is is the rebellion of Israel, is its stubborn rejection of Christ, does that somehow cancel or nullify God's promises? Right? Is it canceling that? And and, and Paul argues, he says, listen, just because you could trace your family line all the way to Abraham, just because you have a Jewish birth certificate does not make you a true Jew, a true Israelite. Because it takes a circumcision of the heart. It takes obedience, wholehearted obedience. It takes all those things. Something that God can do even as you place your faith in him. To be that child of promise. So not every Jew is a Jew, is his argument. We looked at that. 
And then the question about, well, is God playing favorites? I mean, Esau rejected, but Jacob I loved. And, and he has love for, for Jacob and those who come in the line of Jacob. And, and is he playing favorites? And, and again, the answer is, well, no, he's God and he's sovereign. He knows us. He knows because he's God. He knows how you will react, how you will respond, whether you will say yes to Christ or no. He knows. That's not playing favorites. It's God being God. And he extends mercy. John 1 declares that the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. But it says of the Jewish people, but his own would not receive him. Wow. Wow. That, that's, that's a deep loss, isn't it? His own would not receive him. But nonetheless, God sent his son so that Jewish people and non-Jewish people together might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and again, it's, it's God's mercy. It's his choice. He determines our eternal future. But you and I have a role to play in that as well, in that we're to receive him. John 1.12 says that to those who received him, that is by an act of their will, they believed on the Lord Jesus he gave the right to become children of God. And so you've got this connection that's, that's there. And that brings us all the way to Romans 9 and verse 18. And remember, it kind of summed up uh, the ending of our message last week. Romans 9, 18. So God will have mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And he hardens those whom he wants to harden. In other words, he, let, he turns them over to the choices, their, their, their choices, their consequences of their actions. He turns them over to those things. And God says, I know how this is going to play out because I'm God. And I know it all. And it's my desire that you would receive the mercy and grace that I'm extending. But you do choose. Will you or won't you? Where does it fall? we got this incredible issue of the sovereignty of God, the free will of man. And John 9 and verse 19 and following, Paul now jumps in even deeper, right? Got a whole bunch more questions. Notice that as we look at our text this morning, verses 19 and following. Verse 19, NIV, it says this. One of you is going to say to me, then why does God still blame us? Who can resist his will? Or in the New Living Translation, you might say, well, why does God blame people for not responding when they've simply done what he makes them do? Can you hear the argument? The, the question's being raised. It seems like a legit question, right? Well, God's sovereign. He's powerful. He knows what people are going to do, obey him or rebel against him. So why does, why, why does he punish them when they can't override his will? Why, why does he punish? Why does his wrath be applied to people in that way? Notice this line of questioning, though. It puts the blame on God. Why are there so few Jewish people in the church? Well, it's God's fault. You know, it, it, somehow God lacks the power to save everyone he promised to save. Or, um, you know, it's, it's, we're saying, well, it's not fair to call us and say we're at fault. We're just doing what God made us to do. And if you're familiar in the church a little bit, there's some theological positions called Calvinism and Arminianism. And this is at the heart of that. And, and in this portion of scripture, you've got this idea, this Calvinism thing says, well, God predetermined, elected those who are going to be in heaven with him. He decided that in advance. And then on the, if you go to hyper-Calvinism, those that aren't, well, you can't do anything about it. It's just going to be how it plays out. You're on the wrong team, right? Arminianism would argue differently and say, well, the choice is totally yours to make. And, and, but it makes it sound sometimes like we've got more power than God, as in we get to choose, and God has to follow that as if we're above him. Well, not so. Can, can you hear the tension and the struggle in, in all of this, right? This is, this is one of those rubber band questions. By the way, I got one of these right here, okay? Rubber band. The thing with the rubber band is, is, is that painful? No. Ouch, right? That hurts. If you let go on one side, it hurts. If you hold things in tension, it's the way it's supposed to be, all right? And what Paul does here in the scriptures is he's helping us with this giant rubber band with sovereignty of God, the free will of people, and how those two things fit and work together. And the scripture holds them in dynamic tension, okay? They're in tension, they're both there in the scripture. You'll find both. But they're held in tension. If you let one side go, it hurts. And it's no longer accurate. 
You have to hold both of them in tension. And what Paul does here is he, he challenges the church to be thinking about this. On the one hand, you have God's plans and purposes that prevail, that win the day. God gets what he determines he wants. Ephesians 1.11, God's plans and purposes prevail. John 1.12, you got to receive Christ. You need to believe on him. By an act of your will, you must cooperate with what God is doing. You and I are involved in that process. We're not just puppets on a string. These things are held in dynamic tension. And so out of this question comes, comes this comment, well, you know, we're just doing what God designed us to do, made us to do, and wherever we fall, that's, we're just doing that. And Paul comes back. You notice how quickly he reacts. Who are you to talk back to God? When you look at verse 20, who are you, O man, to talk back? I mean, that's an instant reaction at that point, right? Paul's responding back quickly. He's saying, just a minute. This is rebuke and correction. How can we as human beings think that we can somehow school God on something he obviously got wrong? That's, that's like me thinking that I could somehow school that judge over there to make the right decision concerning a picture, which I kind of like mine. No. Don't have the right to do that. How much more with God when he's making a decision about eternity and what he's doing in our lives and his gift of mercy and grace and those things? How can we tell God that he's wrong? He's obviously got it wrong. Who am I to say something to God about that? Parents, think with me. How do you feel about kids when they're back talking? Boy, in my household, that was never a good thing. Right? If my dad heard us back talking, not a good thing, right? Paul just does this thing right here, right? Verse 20. Show what his form say to him who formed it. Why did you make me this way? He, he moves into some language that's, that's talking about us as clay. And, and it's comical. Think about this. So here we are. We're this lump of clay, this, this dust of the earth. And we're going to try and school the creator, the potter. The clay is going to tell the potter how it should be. And the scripture, um, in multiple places, talks about the potter and the clay to describe the relationship between God and his people, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4, speaks specifically where God says, go down to the potter's house, watch what's happening, and I've got a lesson for you. And the bottom line is, to that lesson is, the potter gets to do what he wants with that clay. That's his right and privilege. You go to Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 16, and Isaiah uses this similar language, and he's rebuking Israel. Look what it says. You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. He says, you're getting it upside down and backwards. As if you could somehow talk back to the potter. Creation talking back to God as if we know better than the creator. Can the pot say to the potter? He knows nothing. He needs schooling. Isaiah 45, 9. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. A pot shirt, that's a piece of broken pot. You're just a little pot shirt, something broken on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? What's, what's the point? Paul says, we got nothing to say to the, God, to the God of the universe, the one who makes, the one who is the potter. Does the clay actually talk to the potter and say, you got to do this in my way? The answer being no. God's response. Do you remember Job? Job figured he had a lot of things figured out, right? And God then begins to school him and say, Job, let me ask you some things. Where were you when I did all these things? And Job had to repent of that. He had to turn away from that. He acknowledged that he had no right to speak those things. Verse 21, notice in Romans 9. Does, the potter, uh, does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? The word noble there has this idea of something that's got exquisite design, something that's got brilliant colors, that's, that's a treasure. It's an incredible work of art. And by the way, there were some of those uh, at the Fine Arts Exhibit at the Montana Fair. There was some amazing clay that was turned into noble clay vessels. Really cool, right? Incredible. It's, it's a treasure. It's, it's something that's done that way. And, but then there's the common clay vessels. They, they were hardly fired, right? There's no color to them maybe at all, but, but it, what you do is you put salt in those or spice or pieces of bread or olive oil or water or other food items. In fact, some of them actually are actually used for chamber pots. Need I say more? 
right? So you understand what that means, right? <laughs> Can't get to the bathroom, use the pot. Okay. The, the potter has the right to make clay for whatever purposes he deems. That's God's right as the potter. And yours and my right as the clay is to yield to the potter, to what he purposes. Paul places this in front of us again and says, what right are we to say, why have you made me like this? Friends, this is a portion of scripture that speaks loudly, not only about the sovereignty of God, the mercy of God, and soon the patience of God, but here's where else it speaks to us about. In a world where we want to say back to God, why did you make me like this? I don't like my body shape. I don't like my gender. I don't like my identity. I don't like these things. God is saying, just a minute. I made you for purpose. My heart is good towards you. There are good things when you work within my design. When you step outside of it, it's not a good thing. You're, you're not settling for what's best. Something far less. This answers that issue in our generation right now that is asking so many questions. Basically, the clay is saying to the potter, you made a mistake, let me get you straightened out here. And by the way, I choose this alternative. I choose something that I've created. And I get to choose. So my pronoun is, and I choose. And yet God says, male and female, I've created you. There are only two sets of pronouns. Are we going to argue with God on that? Or are we going to say, God, help me to understand that more? And where I maybe struggle in those areas, would you help me to understand what you intend? And how you help me put that all together. Friends, this scripture speaks to that very, very clearly. Look with me at this question from a different angle. Notice verse 22. There's a bunch of what ifs. Okay? What if? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath? Paul turns this around. He asks a rhetorical question, right? And, and the what if isn't doubting. The what if is actually amplifying the truth of this statement. So what if, and it really is this way, right? <clears throat> God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with tremendous patience the objects of his wrath. So what if God's wrath is held back because of his patience? What if? The, this idea that mercy is tied to patience. This, this rubber band tension that we're talking about, the sovereignty of God. On the one side, the wrath of God. On the other side, the mercy of God. And what holds it together? Intention. The patience of God. Tied together. Look with me as Paul articulates this for us. So what if wrath is held back by his great patience? Because God's Wrath, his judgment, comes because there's been an injustice that's happened. There's been sin that's taken place. And God, as the judge of the universe, has the right to apply justice, penalty, consequence. He has the right to do so. And yet the scripture says that though he has that right, yet in his mercy and in his kindness, he's delayed that wrath. He's kept it in check. He's restrained it. He's held it back. It's all about God's mercy and his patience. So what if his patience is what makes room for mercy? This long suffering of God. What if that's the key that opens the door so that he does not treat us as our sins deserve? Because he holds back. He restrains. He holds back that justice until such a time as he determines that's the day of judgment. This is where it all unfolds. And so God extends undeserved kindness and mercy and grace because of this incredible patience of God. And that word patient, if you're okay with writing in your Bible, you can just write the word long-suffering because that's what that word literally means, macrothumia, long-suffering, painful, difficult, long-suffering. And yet God in his patience 
made room so that his mercy could be expressed. So again, another what if. What if his patience opens the door for mercy to cancel wrath? What if the patience of God opens the door for mercy to cancel wrath? I don't want to just skate by some language here that should probably make us pretty uncomfortable. Because when you read in Romans chapter 9, in verse 22, it says that God bears with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction. Do not skate by those terms. That is heavy language. It's judgment language. It's God's judgment being applied. Is the Bible here, though, saying something about what's been called a double election? In other words, God created some people to be saved and created other people to be condemned to hell, and that's just how it is, and let it play out. Is that what the Bible's teaching? First, let's notice that sinful people are the object of God's wrath. All have what? Sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are death. Is anybody exempt? No. So all are objects of his wrath. We're all guilty as charged. We've sinned against God and we're guilty of rebelling against him. It's why Christ came to redeem and to restore us. But notice that we are called those who have been prepared for destruction. In other words, outfitted for eternal punishment. If you just leave it there and let that sit we are between a rock and a hard place, and there is no hope. All have sinned, fall short of the glory. This is, this is what we deserve. God's word tells us this is what's coming. But friends, if you go there, remember, you just let go of the rubber band. His mercy is tied to his patience. And that patience opens the door for his mercy to be applied. And that mercy cancels God's wrath because of the cross, because of that which Christ has done for us. I want you to notice in the scriptures, God's mercy and patience, how they're tied together, and it delays judgment. So Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. This is us. We live just the same as everybody else. We are objects of that wrath. Ephesians 2 and verse 4, though. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we're dead in our transgressions. Notice God, in his mercy, extended life. We deserve judgment, but we didn't get that. We got life through Christ. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. He's patient with you. And get this, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God says, my desire is that you would be with me. I've done everything necessary for you to come to me and have that relationship to God through Christ. And so in my mercy, that's being extended because of my patience. Judgment is coming. It's not that day today. Today is a day of mercy and grace. It's not the day of the Lord today. In his great patience, he calls out, invites people to come to him and receive that mercy and receive that grace. And so these things are held in dynamic tension. Notice how the day of the Lord, the day of judgment and God's mercy, but he's what? He's patient because he doesn't want anyone to end up in hell. His desire is that we would choose well and choose right. This is God's heart. If you stop and look with me again, we see this in the words that Paul writes next in verse 23 and following. Notice he's talking about the objects of wrath prepared for destruction, verse 23. But what if, here's another what if, did he, what if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of what? His mercy. Those that deserved wrath receiving mercy, that which we don't deserve, which he prepared in advance for glory. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness, His grace, His mercy, leads you towards repentance? Mercy opens the door 
because of the grace of God, the patience of God. And allows us to do that 180 turn. It's called repentance, having a change of heart, change of mind, change of direction that says, God, I receive what you're saying. I, I get it. I understand what you're telling me, who I am, and that I have nothing to offer you. I can do nothing to satisfy you. There's nothing I can do that changes the scale in my favor. I can't put my finger on the scale because I have nothing to offer. But, oh God, where I deserve judgment, what have you done? For God so loved the world he gave his son, right? That whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. And he sent Jesus, why? To condemn the world? No. The scripture says not to condemn the world, but rather to save, to rescue. This is God's heart. Mercy, patience, grace given. This is what it means. And so this sets the tone for what we're going to look at in these next chapters. Romans, the rest of nine, few more verses, then 10 and 11. Paul's going to keep delving into this whole Jewish nation of Israel, non-Jewish people, Gentiles, who receive grace, how does this all work? Paul's going to spend two more chapters working on this, helping us grasp this. But for today, let me look at this last point, verse 24. <clears throat> what if... He did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy. Even us, Paul says, us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. What if God's patience means that both Jews and non-Jewish people or Gentiles can be one big happy family? What if God did this, and he did, so that people of all nations can be together as the church, one body, one heart, one voice, one Lord, one Savior. What if God did that because of his patience and his great mercy? Galatians 3, verse 26. Paul expresses it this way. You are all sons, and I'm going to add the word daughters because it belongs there, sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ. Neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. The word ecclesia, church, means called out. As in called out, called together, people of God. That's the church. And God says, I'm choosing people from all nations. Yes, Israel. Yes, this is my people. Yes, the, 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 the salvation history flows through Israel. Yes, but it goes to all people. And all people are called to be part of that church and become part of that one big family. And Paul says, this is not just wishful thinking. He says, do you not remember what the prophet said? So as you look at this uh, chapter as it closes out, Notice that there's quotes from Hosea and from Isaiah, two different prophets, right? Paul starts with this, remember how Hosea declared from the Lord that he would take people that are not my people and make them my people, all right? So if you go back and look in the Old Testament, Hosea is one of the minor prophets, and as, as he and his wife had children, he gave them names but how would you like to name your kid this, all right? So for his daughter, who was born first, uh, she was named Lo Rama, which means not loved. Wow, how would you like that one for a name? This is my daughter, not loved. Later, his son was born, Lo Ami, not my people. Can you imagine what it was like for those kids growing up, hearing their names spoken? They were living illustrations of God saying, you are not acting like my people. You are not loving me, and I'm not loving you at this moment. And it was a message to the children of Israel to get turned around. But notice how Paul applies this not just to Israel, but to the non-Jewish people too. And says, listen, those who are not loved, those who are not my people, God says, here's what I'm going to do. In my mercy, in my grace and kindness, with great patience, I'm going to bring them to a place where they become my people and they are loved and they're with me for eternity. This is what I'm going to do. This is what God has done in his great patience and mercy to us. So you've got <clears throat> Hosea in that, in that way. By the way, 1 Peter 2.10, Peter makes the same comparison, right? Once you were not a people, now you're the people of God. What's he saying? He's quoting Hosea. You were not a people, but now you are. And he's talking about the church, both Jew and Gentile. You had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. 
Paul adds another Hosea reference, chapter 1 and verse 10 of Hosea. In, in the very place where it was said, you're not my people, they'll be called sons and daughters of the living God. I'm going to call people from the nations and their family. They're my sons, they're my daughters, they belong at my table. God says, this is what I'm doing. Paul goes on, he quotes from Isaiah, chapter 10. And there the word of the Lord was coming against Israel because of their sin and their rejection of God. He says, the number of the Israelites will be like sand in the sea, but only a remnant will be saved. God says, I'm turning them over to the consequences of their sin. Many will not make it, but there will be a remnant. There will be those who have authentic faith that are true Israelites. And, and I will save those people, but it's going to be a relatively small number. Can you see how this answers the question for the church? Why are so few Jewish people part of the church right now? Because God says there will be a remnant from my people. He did not say that every Israelite will be saved. He did not say that. He said a remnant. Those who are true, genuine Israelites. The second quote comes from Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 9, which if you read the book of Isaiah, that first chapter, Paul's talking, or the scripture's talking about how far Israel has fallen, how sick they are from the head to the toe with sin. But in the midst of that, it says this, unless the Lord Almighty left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, those two cities that God wiped out in Genesis, he wiped them out because of their sin. The scripture and the, the prophet is saying that would have been us if not for God's mercy. And the point is, there will be a remnant. God is working. God is bringing Jewish people to faith in Christ, even as he's bringing people from other nations to faith in Christ. God is doing both in his sovereignty. But it's God's patience that allows mercy to come. How are you doing with this dynamic tension? We love answers that are nice and easy, right? We don't like tension that seem opposites, and yet God has just that for us. His judgment, his mercy, and oh, in his great patience, mercy cancels sin through the cross. And where we've landed this morning is right here. It's called a Jonah 4 moment. Do you remember that part of the scripture? Jonah who was asked by God to speak to the Ninevites about their sin and pronounce judgment. Jonah has said, I'm out of here. I'm going the other way. God says, no, you're not. Send a storm, send a fish. Got him to Nineveh. Jonah proceeds to speak what God had told him to tell him in the first place. And the king and the people threw him out, said, we don't want to listen to you, right? No. They listen. They heard it. The scripture says they turned from their sin. They repented. They called on the Lord for mercy, what they didn't deserve. They were the worst of the worst in the nations of that time. And they received what? Mercy. And how's Jonah doing about that? Remember the Jonah 4 moment? He's on the hill watching. God, you said you're going to judge this nation. I'm waiting for your judgment to come. I want to see that fire fall from heaven. Awful hot out here, Lord. Still waiting. Whoa, thanks for that shady plant. Lord, what happened to my shade? Some bug ate this plant. What's God's words to Jonah? You're worried about yourself. And I gave you that plant for the shade. You're not willing to be showing mercy and compassion as people that turn from their sin. But as a God of the universe, I'm willing to extend mercy, though they don't deserve it. I'm extending mercy because they turned from their sin and called out to me. And in my patience, I'm withholding judgment. Jonah, what are you going to do about that? You and I live right there. We live in a world that deserves God's judgment. That judgment day is coming. Do not fool yourself. It is coming. Christ's return is nearer now than when we first believed. That is true. And God knows the timing of that. Time is short. I hear this all the time, church people. Time is short, pastor. Yeah, I know. And what are you doing to help your neighbors find Jesus? The 
There's a part of me that wants to say, you know, here's my chart. Here's how it's all going to fly. You know, here's the end times. Here's how it all goes. Yes, yes. Now tell me how you're reaching your neighbors for Jesus. Because they want to be with him if they knew what was coming. Show me what we're doing there. I think God would be more impressed with that than whether I can explain all the stuff that, frankly, I don't know how it all fits together because he does, I don't. I do know it's coming. I know enough. But what about these people that don't know Jesus? And what are we doing? Am I just Jonas and I'm just waiting for, you know, we're out of here and they're getting what they deserve? Friends, is that what God's called us to be and to do? Don't you need God's mercy and grace like I do? Does, doesn't our neighbor need that? Don't we want to help them understand the God who loves them and wants to show them mercy and doesn't want them to perish, doesn't want them condemned? Friends, it's why we're here. It's why we're here. God's talking to us today, isn't he? It's a Jonah 4 moment. It comes right out of this text. God says, here's how I want to respond to people. Now I want my people to be my messengers of that message and express mercy and grace and patience and faithfulness to reach those who are not yet with him. Pray with me. Worship team, if you'd come. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for what you're speaking to our hearts Your mercy is beyond measure. Your patience, Father, we struggle to understand. But what's true this morning is you had patience with us. We don't deserve any of it. And yet here we are, God, the recipients of your mercy and grace because of your great love. Oh, God, may we not take that lightly. May we recognize our responsibility to the people around us that have yet to believe, have yet perhaps to even hear. Lord, that's what you have for us. I pray that you would speak Christ through us to a world that is lost, broken, and dying. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen.